Hello everyone and welcome to Live from COP15. I'm Lucy Sheriff, former Environment Editor at the Huffington Post and I'll be chairing today's discussion. Hot on the heels of COP27, COP15, the UN Biodiversity Summit is well underway and ready to set out a critical 10-year plan for how countries will work together to achieve a nature positive world by 2030. That means just eight short years to reverse decades of damage and neglect. We'll hear shortly from our panelists, some of whom are our eyes and ears at this important summit. And we're sure that our discussion will include some hot topics arising from COP15. With $44 trillion or half the global GDP relying on nature, COP15 is not only a once in a decade opportunity to halt the destruction of the natural world but a chance for businesses to get ahead of the curve, securing their future while we are in just a nature emergency rather than a full on existential crisis. But before we start, a few notes on social media and housekeeping. We'd love you to share the event, so please do tag at RSK group and use the hashtag live at COP15 across our social media platforms. You can find us on Instagram at the RSK group and on LinkedIn, Facebook and Twitter by searching at RSK group. Some notes on housekeeping. All attendees microphones are automatically muted throughout the webinar. Please do post questions during the webinar. There will be a closing Q&A session um, so we encourage you to raise questions throughout the discussion. We will try to get through as many questions as we can, but apologies in advance if we don't make it to yours. We'll be passing on any remaining questions to our panelists following the event. Shortly after the webinar, you will receive a link to a quick survey. Please do take a few minutes to prov provide feedback so we can improve on future events. So today I'm joined by five experts. Could you please all turn your cameras on? Welcome everybody. So first up we have Steph Ray, who is an ecologist and biodiversity expert with more than 25 years of global experience. She's director and chief sustainability officer at RSK and founder of Nature Positive and Mark Goff, Chief Executive Officer at Capitals Coalition, a global collaboration of business, governments, and civil society that is transforming the way decisions are made by including the value provided by nature and people, and both are on the ground in Montreal. Hi, Mark. Hi, Steph. Do you want to quickly introduce yourselves and give us a quick briefing on how COP15 feels so far? Um, okay, thanks very much, Lucy. Um, well, it's great to be here and actually connect with some people out in the rest of the world, because I feel like I've been in a bit of a COP15 bubble for the last week or so. Um, there's a huge amount going on, obviously, and it's been great to interact with people from all over the world, from business, governments, and, and civil society, all with, with a really strong shared agenda. Um, and I've been here with several hats on, so, um, with my, my work hat, if you like, as director of Nature Positive, this is very much what we do for a living. So it's kind of, it's really great to talk to people and find out that, you know, we're all struggling with the same issues and we're, we're, we're working on moving things forward in the same areas, which is fantastic. Um, but I'm also here representing a conservation charity, the Mammal Society, um, and a, a learned society, the Chartered Institute for Ecology and Environmental Management. So I'm, I'm pulling together all of these different fragmented parts of my identity and where they all fit into the COP agenda. So a really hectic week so far. Sounds like it. And Mark, how have you found it so far? Tiring. <laughs> um, <laughs> these things always are. It's, um, it's, it has been really exciting though being here. There's so much momentum going on and so I'm here representing this for nature a few years ago myself and, and Marco Lambertini at WWF to be a vehicle to actually bring business into the conversations at the COP and I'm sure we'll talk a little bit more about uh, all of that in a minute one thing I did just want to say though Lucy you said there that the 44 trillion dollars um, relies on nature 
that World Economic Report that that figure came from, I think is slightly confusing because actually it's not half of GDP, everything depends on nature. And in that report, it's actually, that was, they're talking about highly dependent and things like that. But we've got to be clear that um, there was yesterday, there was a great session where someone said, hold your breath for 10 seconds. Now, after you've done that and you're not breathing, you realize how much we depend on the clean air, the water and things like that. So everything we do, all the economies, all the business, all society is dependent on nature. We need nature. That's a fantastic point. Yeah, you're absolutely right. Um, and ne next up, we have Jane Davidson. So Jane is on a mission to mainstream laws to protect the well-being of future generations. Her know-how and passion were forged as a Welsh government minister, university pro vice chancellor, and land restorer. Hi, Jane, and, and welcome to our event. Hello, Lucy, and I'm I'm really delighted uh, to be joining you all here today. Thank you. And then finally, we're joined by Natasha Cresswell and Eva Lee, the combined creative force behind Living in Harmony with Nature, a mini series of films that we will be introduced to today. Welcome, both of you. Hi, uh, I am an actress, writer and presenter. And last year I made a film for COP26 called Where Are the Warriors? And I also have the pleasure of working at RSK Biosensors. Um, hi everyone, I'm a South Korean interdisciplinary artist working in the UK with a company called Ants Theatre and I'm very excited to be here. Brilliant, well we're very excited to have all of you. Um, so as COP15 negotiations are in progress, it is fair to say that although dialogue around the challenges ahead is louder than ever, the world has so far failed to act. For example, not meeting the HE biodiversity targets that were last year agreed upon at COP10 in Nagoya, Japan. Sorry, not last year, last agreed upon at COP10 in Nagoya, Japan 12 years ago. So to start, uh, a question for all of our panelists. What are the big conversation topics you've spotted already arising at COP15? Steph, perhaps you could start us off. Oh, you're still, I believe you're still muted. There we go. There we go. Um, yeah, there, there's, a, there's obviously a huge amount of, of interesting topics, but if I'm just picking one, the thing that, that I'm really looking forward to seeing if we can make progress on is around um, incentives and subsidies. Because at the moment, we know that around 2% of global GDP is spent on activities which are actively harming biodiversity they're actively harming the environment and so you can imagine the power of being able to to redirect and repurpose some of those incentives and subsidies towards positive action what a huge and transformative effect that would be so and, and one of the the key issues of course is actually identifying where all where all of that money is going in the first place so there's a huge job of work to do but there seems to be some some real momentum gathering around that point at the moment lucy you're muted <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Didn't want to interrupt you halfway through. Mark, uh, I'll, I'll hand over to you now. So um, one of the key things for me here is, is the momentum. So normally businesses, I was at the last COP four years ago on biodiversity. Um, we had about 30 businesses there in the room. Uh, you know, there was hardly anyone there. They were mainly the, the oil and gas or the mining companies that were there. This time, what we've done at uh, WBCSD, CDP, Business for Nature, ourselves and others and Textile Exchange, we've opened up our delegations. So I've actually got 160 people walking around with Capitals Coalition badges on here um, that we've said to businesses, come into these conversations with us um, and actually get engaged. So that sort of momentum, um, we think there's over a thousand businesses, we haven't got the actual numbers yet, but um, having that sort of momentum, those sort of conversations is really key to bring in the private sector into this. And I think if you go back to the climate COP in Paris 2015, um, we know that actually the reason why we got so much more momentum in that was because the public private sector started working together. And that was a key part of unlocking some of those challenges and making sure we were moving forward. What we're trying to do here at COP15 is also do that, bring the private sector voice into these conversations. 
Wow, that is impressive, actually. Um, and Jane, what, what have you seen coming up? Well, I, I, I'd like to build on um, that, that point, actually, because I've been to a lot of COPs over a very long period of time. And uh, when I think back to, to Nagoya and the HE targets, you know, we actually think, thought we were getting somewhere then. Um, but the point is, is that targets almost are a way of putting something down on paper that you never have to achieve unless populations make demands of governments. Mm -hmm. um, and if you don't get that, then the governments are let off the hook. Um, and then they just carry on apologising. And then in Britain, they've been apologising <laughs> ever since we've had cops for not, be, not delivering on, on, on targets. And that's pretty well true of both the um, biodiversity COP. Slightly less true of climate, but only because we were one of the first countries to have climate legislation back in 2008. But when you get important populations, your wealth creators, telling governments that this really matters, that is a game changer. And mm -hmm. I think that if we see um, those kind of mandatory outcomes in terms of businesses out of this COP, then I would feel that it has got the opportunity to put pressure on all governments, particularly in the global north. And that's the main issue, because if the other area that I'm particularly interested in is the 30 by 30, 30% 30 um, uh, in, in terms of nature for countries on land and sea. And of course, it's the developed countries that don't have that at the moment. So it's the global north, it's the economic countries or think oh, countries have completely got it wrong because their economy is not based on ecology but it's the developed north which are the ones um uh, that will need to put a lot of effort in to make that happen so yeah. actually that also feels to me a bit like a re re if, if there's such a word a reparative opportunity in the same way as the reparation between global north and south was ha happened at cop 27 mm -hmm. Oh, yeah, that makes complete sense and a, a very important point. Um, and Natasha, what, what's been coming up for you? Um, I think one of the targets gaining a lot of attention is the role of Indigenous peoples in managing biodiversity. Mm -hmm. uh, there's that figure floating around at the minute that 80% of biodiversity is being managed by Indigenous peoples already. So we clearly need to bring them in, make them a part of these conversations and listen to the wisdom that they have. I feel like we talk a lot about bringing biodiversity into climate and this feels like a way of bringing people into both. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's completely true. Um, and Eva, how about you? Um, I was most intrigued by the theme of COP this year. I noticed signs in pictures at the conference center about ecological civilizations and building a shared future for all lives on earth. And this seems right now like a really far away ambitious goal, but I think that in itself is a really exciting prospect. And um, one of the reasons why we wanted to make a film about it. Absolutely, and we're, we're looking forward to watching the trailer later. Um, so thank you everyone. Um, Let's first speak to our on the ground panelists who are joining us from Montreal, Mark and Steph, um, and ask them a few of the questions that are already coming through from our audience. So the first one um, for Mark is, are we getting closer to securing a robust global diversity framework? And what are some of the main sticking points? Ooh. Um, <laughs> it's um, Jane will know this. We're at that point in the conversation where, I mean, last uh, last week there were still 1,800 brackets. Now, a bracket means that there isn't agreement on what's going to be said. And to go into a COP like this with still that many brackets where the negotiating parties haven't agreed on something is really challenging. They've been working really hard going through to 2, 3, 4 o'clock in the morning at the negotiating teams. We've had some challenges with people walking out. We've had, you know, really strong debates. Um, and that's been, uh, that's what these things are about. Um, but I think that there is signals now, particularly the ministers have just arrived, so we're at that point in the COP where actually the negotiating teams have done almost as much as they can. And we're now moving up to the ministerial level to sign off on it. So there are some good signs. Target 15, which is the one for the business sector, that one there, really, really important. That's talking about mandatory assessment and disclosure 
of risks, impacts, and dependencies. Now, there's going to be a few words that are moving around, but it looks like as of yesterday that that is, has got enough support to go through. So we're hoping that that one will be there. And this means that all large businesses, particularly, that's what it's focusing on, so it's not every business, but all large businesses will be required to assess and disclose their risks and impacts and dependencies, which means that those that are leading, which I'm sure that a lot of the uh, companies that are on the call are leading companies, it means that it levels the playing field. It means that all companies are required to do that. And those leaders actually can keep on going forward, but everyone is now doing it. So that's really key. I think the ambition is the other bit. And um, we were just talking about the ecological civilizations, et cetera, and China obviously being the host here in Montreal. The, um, the ambition levels, we've got to make sure that holds. One of the most dangerous things of where we are at the moment is that we come out with a weak global biodiversity framework. Um, what we really need is an ambitious one. A weak one for 10 years is much, much worse um, than actually having none at all, in fact. So we need to keep that ambition high. And words such as nature positive, in the opening text to say we need to halt and reverse nature loss and make sure we're recovering. That sort of direction is going to be really clear and important. Thank you. And um, a next question that's come through for Steph. Taking the UK as a case in point, the UK is one of the most biodiversity poor nations in the world. Why is that? And does that mean that this process is of increased importance for the UK? Okay, um, I think it's for a start. I think it's really important for everybody. I think this is very much a global problem. It's it's interconnected. Biodiversity doesn't respect any national boundaries. So I think this is something that we do have to work on globally together. But going back to the point in the question of Britain as one of the most biodiversity depleted nations. Absolutely. Yes, we've seen, I think our biodiversity intactness index is around 50% or something like that. And the, it should be at around 90% to stop this kind of tipping point that we're looking at. So we're, we're sort of the worst performing country in the G7. I think we're in the bottom 10% or so globally. So, so this is clearly a huge issue for us as a nation. Um, why are we in that state? Um, partly it's to do with being a small island. Um, but possibly you you manage the things you look at and the way you, the way you frame the biodiversity problem, if you like, can will affect how well you're tackling it. And traditionally, I think we've seen biodiversity as a specialist interest that lives inside a DEFRA in the Ministry for Environment, and and that's where we deal with it. And we've dealt with it through things like conservation policy, and we've got some quite good policies on nature conservation around species protection and protected sites and so forth but the point is that biodiversity isn't just limited to protected sites and individual species the whole point of the concept of biodiversity is that it's those interactions between all living things everywhere and so we have to stop applying it just to the the you know couple of percent of protected uh, of, of our area that's in protected sites or to the maybe 7% of land that's um, affected by development with biodiversity net gain policies, and then look at the sort of 80% or so of the countryside that we manage agriculturally. Because essentially the, agri the agricultural industry is for biodiversity, what the energy industry is for climate. That's where the big impacts are, and that's where we've got to, to look at what we've been doing over past decades and, and get an agenda to change. Can I just add in, Lucy, sorry, the, um, one of the really interesting things here is um, what's, uh, building what Stephanie was saying, is that one of the only countries to send a financial minister in here is the UK. And I think that's really interesting, that actually the UK is also not just sending DEFRA, they've sent people from Treasury as well to this meeting. Um, so that is a really interesting thing, because we see that at the climate cops, we have a lot of the finance ministries going to that, but here it is mainly the environmental uh, ministries. But the UK has sent a, a, a delegation from the Treasury. So I think that that connected up system of that is, is really key. Yeah, that's really impressive because it's, it's definitely one of the main aspects I always look at how you kind of tie in the business world and the financial world with environment because at the end of the day, money talks. So it's, that's really great to see, actually. Um, There's been a huge driver from the finance sector this time around, haven't there? There's massive presence from from finance institutions generally, so that is a real a real difference with this COP, I think. 
Yes, and it was the first first finance day we've ever had at a biodiversity COP was yesterday. So we've never had a finance day at a biodiversity COP. Um, so it was brilliant to see that and all the big financial institutions, some announcements from some of the big ones to put the fund together from private sector funding for 300 million. Um, it's just been announced. So yeah, it was great to see that. Wow, Sorry. that's very heartening. So fingers crossed. Um, and Mark, does lack of ambition risk undermining global action on biodiversity? Yes, uh, I think as we were just saying, the if the um, if the ambition isn't there, then I think it's going to be very difficult. I, I think the good thing is um, we've got to try and be positive, particularly at this point um, in the negotiations, um, because it's not over yet. It's not really isn't over, and we think it's going to go on a couple more days actually. Then we um, predicted these things often drag a little bit at the end to get that final agreement. But the good thing is, is the mobilization, as we were saying, of business, of indigenous people, of all of that coming into this conversation, that that is going to create momentum. No matter what happens here, there is momentum. I've um, at the climate cops, you often hear deals being made in the back rooms between the private sector and between governments that have solutions, public private finance, et cetera, going on. That's common in the climate cop. We're starting to see things here with the private sector coming through with solutions that can help to try and mobilize finance, to try and mobilize solutions. That is actually happening um, here as well. I think that momentum, we've got to make sure that continues towards no matter what um, biodiversity agreement we get out. Definitely, definitely. Um, and for Steph, uh, another question for you. Um, it's clear that the issues being talked about aren't just the special interests of the environment departments. How well is the need to protect biodiversity being applied across all policy areas? Um, well, we've, we've sort of slightly talked to that in, in the last question around we're starting to see interest from, from things like Treasury. Um, I'd say it's really quite quite good here at the moment in that we're seeing representatives from businesses in lots of different sectors who are taking a broad interest in this. And we're starting to see how biodiversity, you know, because it underpins everything that we do, it isn't um, a straightforward relationship and it affects not just our environment policy, but our, our housing and our infrastructure and our taxation policy. So yeah, I'd say we, we are starting to see that. And it's this, this kind of looking at it looking at everything we do through this lens of how is that going to affect biodiversity how well will that will will that manage our resources sustainably as a basic way of thinking about mm -hmm. policy across a whole range of areas and i think i think that's where we've got to go to if we're going to see the transformative change that we're looking for yeah definitely it's it's weaving biodiversity into kind of every fabric of life and I guess completely changing our our attitudes towards it and and I think Mark you were saying earlier that exercise of holding your breath um for 10 seconds and you realize that it's it's key to our our survival um so thank you Steph and Mark um for kicking us off to such a strong start we've just received another question regarding policy issues asking why have we always missed nature targets before and how do we get people to take a longer term view on the subject? Jane, are you happy to answer this? <laughs> um, well, I, th I think that part of the reason that we, that we miss nature targets uh, is because we don't make any further demands um, and that actually what we don't do is turn nature targets into law. Um, and in fact, if we, you know, for, for me, very clearly, I mean, and, and you'd expect me to say this coming from Wales, where we have the Wellbeing of Future Generations Act, it takes, it takes Steph's point about the fact that actually all policy is integrated. You know, ideally, we wouldn't have a climate cop in one place with a set of negotiators, often very, very experienced negotiators at the heart of government. Most people send their prime ministers, et cetera, and then, and then have a biodiversity cop somewhere else um, uh, without that, that panoply. We would combine them and we would do that in the context of what does social justice look like? Um, mm -hmm. And so what, you know, I think, I think my view on targets has been probably pretty well ever since the HE targets were created in back in Nagoya um, is that actually targets are only meaningful if you also demand the plan that shows you 
how you're going to get from where you are now to where you want to be and within a specified period of time. Because if you don't do that, we end up in the position that we're in at the moment, whereby you know we have uh, however many countries, um, it's about 197 countries signed up to the Sustainable Development Goals to be achieved by 2030. That's the target. And Wales, not even a UN member state, is still the only country in the world that has a legal mechanism to deliver on sustainable development goals. So for me, it's, you know, targets are in a sense what you do when you know what the plan is and you know what the most ambitious target that you're trying to realize is. And then you set the budget, the policy, the practice, the people, the pilots, the outcomes in place to bridge the two. But I just don't believe you can do that unless you take the integrated approach that brings culture, society, economy, environment all together. Yeah, complete, I completely agree. Um, and why did Wales go down this route? Well, I think, I mean, I mean in many ways, um, all I think all breakthroughs are uh, made by many people. <laughs> <laughs> and often come about by accident and and this is this is the same i mean there were some very very committed people back in um 1997 who wanted to capitalize on the very strong community and sustainability orientation of wales and its public authorities and then when the first devolved government came in in 1999 with the government of wales act it, they wrote into it through the UK Parliament a duty to promote sustainable development in everything we did. And this, for me, coming in as one of the new, what was then called the National Assembly for Wales members, and particularly in my first year as the deputy presiding officer or speaker and making the laws of, of this new institution, this was manna from heaven as a, as a kind of environmentalist and educator. Um, but it was really hard to deliver because it wasn't defined. I mean, we used the Brundtland definition of sustainable development so that we could make it absolutely clear that we didn't want to put a further burden on future generations. But actually, what do you mean when you talk about sustainable development? What do you mean when you talk about promote? So in short, we spent 10 years trying to do those things. We tried it as an overarching philosophy. We tried it as 10 things for a better planet. And we then, and I was determined when I took on the actual responsibility uh, for all of this, uh, climate as well, that actually I was going to make it the central organising principle of government. We agreed that. And it still didn't change what we were doing. And therefore, I suddenly realised, and it was the death of the Sustainable Development Commission, which was the singular day that led, led to the change. When I came back from that, knowing that the UK government was getting rid of the Sustainable Development Commission after a decade of independent advice to governments of many political persuasions in the UK, I thought, we need a law. And mm. I had the opportunity to go to my party conference and put a, an emergency resolution forward on, on a long-term law. <laughs> so it, was a, it was an emergency resolution um, uh, in the early part of 2011 that led to the commitment to the Wellbeing of Future Generations Act that then was um, uh, passed in 2015. Wow, that's really quite something and, and definitely an example other countries should follow. Um, have you seen an impact on on any other countries you know have other countries looked to wales and and tried to follow in in your footsteps well i think it's not so much footsteps of wales um although you know i've written a book about this which is called future gen lessons from a small country but the 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 i think what other countries are interested in is our the fundamental proposition that i've been trying to address pretty well ever since i've been a politician has been how do you make good decisions for mm -hmm. current and future generations? You know, so I mean, and if you start thinking about not just the immediate short term, it does change the way you think. So what the Wellbeing of Future Generations Act does is it actually marries up, you know, your global relationship 
uh, prosperity without mentioning the word growth, operating within environmental limits, enhancing biodiversity in order to address the loss, ta tackling health and inequality, uh, for, um, and also protecting and enhancing heritage and culture. And doing all those things together is actually about a nation's identity. So I wouldn't, I'd see people looking to Wales to say, how did you do it? But I'd see them it being made in, in the image of other countries. And that's the really important element. And that's the message that Natasha gave in terms of indigenous communities, because <laughs> you need indigenous communities to define their, their, their future in this way. But there are 12 countries across the world, including in Canada, um, looking at this. Uh, pretty well at the moment. There are three in the process of making laws. The UN um, is introducing um, a new role next year where it's going to set up a new futures commission. It's going to ask all countries what they're doing on future generations. It's setting up a new kind of commissioner type role and office. All, and if we hadn't done it, these things may not be happening. I'd hope they'd be happening anyway, but I think sometimes you need the example so that people can think, oh, that's a no-brainer. Why aren't mm. we doing that? Why don't we show mm. that we care when we want to stop an existential crisis? So I think that, but the fundamental thing for me about this is it's not just the what, the goals, it's also how you do it. So mm -hmm. on the face of the act, the process by which you achieve. You have to think long-term, you have to be preventative, you have to think collaboratively, you have to integrate outcomes, and you have to involve people about whom decisions are being made. And it's that marriage of goals and way of getting there that I think means we can show you a plan. <laughs> but we'll only show you the plan for Wales, and it yeah. may be that's, that's useful for other places. And the important thing is, it releases the imagination to think differently. Mm. It's permission to think differently. And Thanks. one of them is very much <laughs> positive. <laughs> yeah. And what a fantastic legacy. Um, well, thank you. Thank you, Jane. Thank you, everyone who's watching for all of your questions coming through. We are trying to get through them. Um, but first, we are extremely excited to introduce Natasha and Eva and their series of mini films living in harmony with nature what does that mean and how does that look in major cities around the world so if everyone could turn off their cameras and we will take a look hey how's korea korea's good it's getting a little cold Mm, it's cold everywhere right now. Cops coming up in Montreal soon. I bet everyone's gonna freeze. I thought cop happened. Oh yeah, it did. This is the biodiversity one. Cop fifteen. The vision is living in harmony with nature. Okay. Okay. Cool. Um, what does that mean? Honestly, I'm not sure. It probably changes for everyone. What they're officially going for is um <clears throat> by twenty fifty. Biodiversity is valued, conserved, restored, and wisely used, maintaining ecosystem services, sustaining a healthy planet, and delivering benefits essential for all people. Okay, okay. What would living in harmony with nature look like for you? Mm, okay. I think the first thing it makes me think of is English countryside and chickens that lay eggs that I get to enjoy. What about you? <laughs> I don't know really. Um, it makes me think of big cities that have nature woven into it, like a modern version of the Hanging Gardens of Babylon and finding a way to let nature thrive in an urban space. Very fantastical kind of thing. But um, yeah, I think it might be because I grew up in Sao Paulo and that's more of like a imaginative, more futuristic version of what you saw. How is it that the same prompt and phrase made us both bring up such wildly different pictures for what it could look like? Well, maybe it's the environments we were exposed to over time. Like I grew up in Brazil, Beijing, Seoul, but only in massive cityscapes. And I was raised by zoologists, always in the UK, always surrounded by animals. 
Yeah, if we have such different views on what living in harmony with nature is, and COP's goal this year is to live in harmony with nature, do you feel like um, you're living up to those standards now? I definitely feel closer to it when I'm back at my mom's house. There's nothing but green spaces and places left to go wild and shopping locally is easy, but I come from a very environmentally conscious town. When I'm back in King's Cross, I think I feel so much further away from that goal. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's interesting you bring up closeness because I was talking to some friends the other day and wanting to say something with the work that we're doing and, you know, be the change you want to see and, and that kind of spirit. But while some of us wanted to make work that tackled issues regarding nature and the environment, just some people don't share the same amount of passion for it, the same level of closeness, I guess. And they care, but not enough to act on it, which got me thinking, what makes you care about nature? I know that you care, and I know that I care, but what's the driving force? So our commonality could be that we both feel a kind of connection to nature. Mm -hmm. And it's been nurtured in a different, you could even say opposing ways, but it's still there. And that drives us to care, to act, despite our differences. Yeah, and I bet with other cultures, you know, with other cities and other people, we would see the same thing. Examples of how connectedness can look, how different environments foster care for different reasons. Through a four-part series investigation, we're going to look at four drastically different cityscapes. We begin our journey in Singapore, a city that has famously kept nature at its core and was built with nature in mind from the get-go. Speaking to residents who have grown up in this rare environment, we'll try and find out what effect the proximity to wildlife might have had on their feelings towards the natural world. Australia is known for its amazing natural wonders, like the Great Barrier Reef and amazing animals that don't occur anywhere else on Earth. But how much do modern Sydneyers really engage with nature? Do the ideologies of Aboriginal cultures affect their connectedness to nature on a more individual level? Back in London, at higher levels, great lengths are being taken to create green corridors, green lungs, and connected areas for nature. But how does that trickle down to the youngest generation's feelings? After that, we head to Seoul. Despite previously not prioritizing green spaces, it's ranked highly as a sustainable city in Asia. But does that statistic translate to the general public's feelings towards nature too? Living in harmony with nature isn't happening yet in the modern world and will be ever changing. Even when we do achieve it, it will look dramatically different everywhere. But the key to getting there, the secret ingredient, does it all really come down to fostering that closeness to nature? And if closeness is a rare commodity, and the resources of the natural world are rapidly becoming one too, how do we combat both together? Let's go find out. That's incredible. Thank you so much for sharing your trailer with us today. It was great to hear about why the film came about. Um, so did anything surprise you during your research? Um, I think one thing that surprised us was finding out that there was no such thing as a good or bad city. There was positive examples and negative examples in everywhere that we were looking. So to take um, two Asian, the two Asian cities, for instance, Singapore and Korea, um, we thought they would have a quote unquote poorer and better example, um, but we realized it wasn't as simple as that. Um, there are a plethora of qualities and traits in each location that affect the way that people engage with nature and things as always are not as black and white as they appear. Mm -hmm. And why did you choose to talk about cities rather than focusing on um, more remote places? 
So most of us live in cities globally, globally sorry, um, approximately 56% of the world's population. Um, this equates to 4.4 billion inhabitants and this trend is expected to continue. Yeah, by 2050, it could double and nearly like seven out of 10 people will be based in cities. And as you can imagine, city dwellers are always less likely to feel that sort of connection to nature. Mm -hmm. And what, why was it important to speak to different groups of people? And, and can you give some examples of who you spoke to? Yeah, so we are setting out our, our adventure next year, but the goal is to speak to two different groups of people in each location. So in Singapore, we're aiming for people who have lived up there, grown up there all their lives and lived in that environment of fostering that closeness to nature and people who have chosen to move there and work there. Uh, for Sydney, we want to talk to Aboriginal people and non-Aboriginal people who have both grown up in Sydney and see how that difference might change their feelings of connectedness. In Seoul, we're looking at people in positions of power in big business and local people on the ground. And in London, we want to take a look at the scientists who are making all of these great policies in London to increase green environments and green spaces, and then also talk to inner city children and see how much it's actually trickling down to them. Yeah, and the reason we set out to interview to seemingly diametrically opposed um, demographics uh, was to get a more well-rounded picture of each city to try and find out what connects them or how much overlap that they would have and if who they are affects their feelings of connectedness to nature as well. Fantastic. Well, I can't wait to watch it. When is it going to be out and available to watch? Ooh, good question. Definitely, it should all be together by the end of next year, hopefully for, for the next time around. Um, but we're going to sort of make it in parts across the year. Oh, fantastic. Well, good luck. Um, thank and thank you. Thank you, everyone. We, we now have a few minutes left, so we're going to open up the floor to some more questions from the audience. Um, please just kind of weigh in with, with anything you have to say. Um, otherwise, I'm going to start picking on people. <laughs> um, so first question um, is from James. Uh, how much representation have the oceans and marine habitats had at COP15 relative to terrestrial ecosystems? Have there been any standout discussions, developments or announcements around ocean recovery, which, of course, is a very, very important topic? So does anyone want to start us off? There's actually an event starting in 10 minutes um, on oceans, which I'm, I was hoping to go to. Um, so I was really pleased to see it on the agenda because it is often, I think the question makes it clear, you know, we often think about where we're standing. We don't think about what most of the planet is made up of. So um, that will be exciting. I'm not aware, Stephanie, um, there's been so many conversations here. Are you aware of any big announcements yet on the ocean? I haven't seen a big announcement on oceans yet, no. Um, but I do think that that sort of marine groups have been quite well represented in the discussions generally, and there's, they've certainly been brought into wider conversations. Um, but no, I haven't seen anything else specific on oceans this time around. And obviously the 30 by 30 that Jane was mentioning is really important because 30 by 30 is not just land, it's about oceans as well. So I'm quite sure, I know there's gonna be a high level announcement from the US, which isn't a signatory to the Convention on Biological Diversity a bit later on, um, I'm not going to predict what it is, but I expect there'll be something in there about oceans. Let's hope so. Um, and another question we've had through, could nations be required to measure their impact on improving by biodiversity per capita, like GDP, but GDB? <laughs> um, I can just very briefly, so target 14, when I was talking about target 15, and sorry, I'm getting a bit technical here, um, target 14 is all about national level accounting. So to make sure that all peoples and all nations have those sets of accounts. And GDP is actually being revised at the moment. A couple of people in our community are involved in that. There will be a chapter this time specifically looking at the value of nature and people going into that. That's not saying we're changing GDP, just to be clear. GDP is what it is, but it's actually talking for the first time about those other capitals, those other values. 
being involved in it and that's being written at the moment mm -hmm. Jane do you think do you think that's something that would that might work well I, th I think I think the experience of um, countries uh, plotting emission reduction um, and particularly where um, those those decisions that are being made that are responsible about what nature re restoration or a nature positive solution as part of the emission reduction looks like um, and what I mean in there is not carbon offsetting by an aviation company that plans to carry on with business as usual and then dump a load of timber in the middle of Wales uh, and then and then take it uh, for the benefit of the of its shareholders that's not <laughs> the way forward but I but I think that there are that we have learned a lot and are still learning a lot by both how you model um, and and how you plot emission reduction. And I think that there are definitely techniques that are being built up through universities on not just on GDP, but also on alternatives to GDP, not just in terms of the capitals, because I was also very much around for um, the, the, the TEAB report and actually thinking about, well, if, if we started um, applying a value to a, a financial value to nature, um, would people um, then understand how important it was? And at the time, I think it, it, it said that it would take something like 450 million pounds worth of investment in terms of uh, replacing bees. And I thought, well, the trouble is there'll be people who just look at that and think, oh, we can pay that. <laughs> and it's, uh, so we have to understand that it's not a, a direct capitals equation. And mm -hmm. I think that's the, that's the critical element for me, which is why I think we should continue to look at challenging GDP because mm -hmm. GDP, I mean, effectively, it's a very common example, but if my house burnt down tonight, I would improve Wales's GDP just by a tiny amount, but just the rebuilding of it would improve the GDP. It's nonsense to have that that kind of element as the basis of our decision making. And one of the things that we really wanted to do with the Wellbeing of Future Generations Act longer term is actually look at what kind of measurements we have in Wales. We're in the process of developing the indicators which will be measuring what we think is of value. Um, and we'll be wanting to, at the very least, run that alongside GDP and others. As a, as a, as a sub-national government, we couldn't do anything else than, than work with the traditional capital approach, but it should be up for challenge. Mm -hmm. Can, can I just clarify, uh, as James just said that there, because um, I run the Capitals Coalition, we originally came out from TEAB and I'm on the TEAB board, yeah. so I do know a lot about that. But the, um, the, what I'm talking about is natural capital, and what I'm really talking about is value. So when I talk about doing this, I'm saying exactly the same, same as Jane. There isn't a difference in that. We need to look at the value that's being created. Value is the relative importance of something. We're not just talking about financial capital. I'm a real capitalist because I've got four of them, not just one. So. Um, <laughs> Fake capitalists have one, which is financial capital. I've got four, so I'm much better capitalist than anyone else. <laughs> um, and another question we've had through, should businesses wait for a global framework or should they start acting now and why and how? <laughs> um, <laughs> the global framework is really important, yes, but no, there is certainly no need to wait. Um, mm -hmm. Businesses need to understand how they rely on nature and how they can impact nature and there are there are plenty of, of what we're calling no regrets actions that businesses can be taking now you don't need to see exactly how the chips are going to fall to start understanding that it's in your own self-interest as a business to mm -hmm. not damage and further to restore the, the parts of the environment that you rely on to go about your day-to-day -day business. So I would say all businesses can be starting to look at how they rely on nature, not just their direct operations, but up and down their value chains. They can start to look at what their, their main impacts are on the environment. They can get ready for, for setting targets through the science-based targets network methodology. They can get ready for disclosure through, through the task force on nature-related financial disclosures, TNFD methodology. Both of those methodologies are still developing, but they're far enough along, they're gonna take you in the right direction. You're not gonna be doing abortive work there. Um, 
But most of all, don't wait to start giving something back to nature. Start taking steps to actually reduce your damaging impacts and to restore nature. So, you know, I'm not talking about necessarily biodiversity offsetting. I'm talking about reinvesting in the ecosystem services that you rely on. If you know that you rely on on a, a good source of clean water, well, what are you doing in the watersheds in the areas where you work to, to help that along? There's lots that we can be doing and, and absolutely eight years is a very short time scale. Um, let's not wait. Mm -hmm. and, and can I just add 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 to that? Because I I just happened this morning to have a a conversation with a business that has put nature on its board, and has actually used company law to do so. Um, and I just thought it was really interesting because they are finding that even in the um, you know they spent two years putting that together, uh, and it's now of interest to a number of other countries and a number of other businesses. But the point is that the impact it's already happening um, on the board because the board is now having to take effectively a lawyer who is a guardian for nature into account who has gone out and discussed with many other people the issues before bringing that approach to the board and i think really imaginative ways for businesses to take on and indeed governments i'm going to be <laughs> challenging governments on this as well but if governments and businesses actively thought about how to deliver a voice for nature on their board, um, uh, that is a very important potential addition, an imaginative addition into this debate. Yeah, it's, it's great when, when private sectors lead the way. <laughs> Definitely. Um, so the next question actually is for um, Eva and Natasha. Uh, we are dealing with this problem due to the failure of the past to emphasize the importance of biodiversity. Is anyone looking into how we can make this a mindset by including awareness and teaching the importance to future generations? And obviously with your with your film series, um, you know, that's one way of kind of communicating the importance of this to future generations. So I'd, I, I'd love to hear kind of what you think we could do or what could be done to communicate better with future generations and involve them in the conversation. Well, there's quite a lot being done already in some ways to communicate. I would argue that as we get into the younger generations, we're all becoming more and more environmentally conscious and nature forward minded. There's way more vegan people I know under 25 than in any age above that. And I think we've learned quite a lot over the years. And while it does differ, in different parts of the world. I would say that we're probably getting better with age, but examples of good things to be doing are raising awareness through documentaries like this, films hopefully does do something. I know that with RSK Biosensors, we're looking into going into schools and teaching them about jobs in the environmental sector. And that's gonna be a really positive thing. If you teach kids that they can do this for work and it's not just a, a reason why you wash plastic after you've used it and then put it in a different bin, I think all of those things add up to understanding the need a bit more and also there's lots of really good initiatives and charities that work on getting inner city kids out of the city and to areas of outstanding natural beauty or parks and forests and just seeing more greenery and stuff like that really really does change people's perception so much because just being able to be in and touch and feel nature changes so much about your perception of it and how much you can care about something like that in the future. Yeah, and I think that's why we thought it was really important to interview children as well and, and kids in schools to see whether these initiatives are getting through to them and and give, getting you know their point of view from it because they are the future generation. They're, they're gonna be the ones living, um, continuing this legacy and um, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, and also and also dealing with whatever we're going to be facing in a in eighty <laughs> mm -hmm. years time. Um, so unfortunately, we've we've almost come to the end. Um, but there is one last question I wanted to ask everybody, um, and that's whether we have or haven't agreed on a framework by the end of the week. What happens next, or what needs to happen next? So Steph, do you want to start us off? <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, I think it's really important that we don't focus on 
this week and getting a framework as being the end and the milestone it's really very much the beginning so i think you know when when you look at what we're trying to achieve what we're setting out to achieve in eight years it's huge um and even to achieve one eighth of that every year needs some pretty some pretty impressive speed of change so i think what we need to happen next is that that theory of change the the detailed steps of how we get from where we are now to this vision of of living in harmony with nature and making making those first steps very quickly mm -hmm. definitely and um, mark um, one of the challenges here is about the implementation mechanisms, as they're calling it. So it's about um, like the, um, making sure that everyone has a fair approach to this. And that is still being debated and I think is going to be a difficult part in the final stages. Um, always about who values, who gets the benefit. That is always a big question. But I think that the um, key thing that we're really, sorry, people coming up into the treehouse, I mean, um, people that are, um, one of the, key things is really about that momentum, making sure that we've got um, a, an action plan to take forward after this. I, mean, I just left a meeting before this where we've got the cop to cop um, people in place. We're actually looking at nature champions to come in, the same as we got for climate champions um, to lead this. Um, we've also got already, so the, you mentioned task force for nature related financial disclosures before, science based targets network. We're talking very close to them. We're, we're making up a package of things to show how they're it's not an alphabet soup, it's a language actually. And if we can learn that language, we can work out how to get through the alphabet soup of different acronyms that are out there. So we're helping from the organizational perspective to make sense of all of that. That's what we need to do. We need to keep that momentum going. And I'm really, really encouraged by all the conversations I've had here that that is going to happen mm -hmm. after this COP. So oops, it won't be this week that we finalize the things. It's probably going to be the end of this week, beginning of next week, probably. But I think that it will go forward. We are going to keep on moving forward no matter what happens here. And Jane? I think, I mean, if, if we think about the title of this COP um, in relation to harmony with nature, of course, this goes back to the very first principle of the very first Rio summit about humans having the right to live in harmony with nature. Our right was to live in harmony with nature. The idea was that nature, we would protect nature because we understood the value to us. So for me, this is about ecology before economy. And just um, uh, the old English teacher in me, um, which is where I kind of started my, my, my career. Um, the word oikos, the Greek for the planet home, has created the words ecology and economy. Ecology is the knowledge of the planet home. Economy is the management of the planet home. And one could ask rather cynically, why do we manage the home that we do not have the knowledge of? And I think that's that we need to get back to the idea. Um, and actually we should all be part of a very singular campaign to remind everybody of what Mark illustrated so well earlier on in this call. We are totally dependent on nature for our lives. We cannot manage it if we do not know it, protect it, serve it, and ensure the future generations have a chance of inheriting a habitable world. So the fight is enormous and the fight has to become bigger with every failed international conference. Definitely, definitely. We are cutting very, very close to time now. So um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to wrap up. Um, thank you so much to our fantastic panel and everybody for joining us and taking part. I'm sure you'll agree this was a very invigorating conversation. We still have a few questions outstanding that we will be passing on to our panellists after this. And you can tune into our previous Route to COP15 activities on the RSK website. Please do share everything, all of your thoughts from today on social media using the hashtag live from COP15. Um, and thank you very much, everyone. Thank you. Thank you.